Hey everybody, hope you're all doing well. I've got a good one for you today, I hope. It is called, Stop Saying the French Are Cowards in War. Uh, I looked at some of my comments before and there was a, a little bit of a obvious French and uh, British rivalry there. Uh, by the way, first, before we get into this, thank you so much for all the wonderful people who are watching. Uh, you guys have helped the channel immensely and I love seeing it uh, grow exponentially. Uh, I hope you do too. You're part of the journey with me. Uh, so don't forget to subscribe because a lot of people aren't subscribed. They just watch, but subscribe, ring the bell. And uh, yeah, so that's a great thing. Thank you. And uh, let's move forward with this. All right. Stop saying the French are cowards in war. Don't underestimate the French military. Any discussion of a nation's reputation in warfare will almost inevitably lead to derogatory remarks directed towards the French. Such as, number one, the French need assistance if they're going to win a war. And number two, the French only win a war if they're fighting against each other. And number three, that's the French flag. That's the extent of my knowledge. Their military exploits are the punchline of countless jokes, memes, and other disparaging comments, lampooning them as cowards or inept on the battlefield. The reality, however, is much different. Throughout its long history, the French nation has had an extensive and distinguished record of military triumphs, dating back as far as the early Middle Ages. In actual fact, for millennia, French soldiers have fought and died with courage, skill, and distinction. The story of French military history begins in the wake of the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. The Franks, a Germanic tribe from further east, pushed westward into what is now France. And under the reign of King Clovis I, the land in the Pyrenees in the southwest, the Alps in the southeast, and the Rhine River in the east was also secured. That's right. Though yeah. these borders would shift countless times over the intervening centuries, the rough area of French territory had been established. Clovis's descendant, Charles Martel, played an integral role in world history. In 732 AD, he and his Frankish army prevented the Arab Umayyad dynasty advance into France, inflicting a crushing defeat on their enemies at the Battle of Tours. With this victory, the ever rising. I didn't know his name. Okay, cool. That makes sense. All right. The tide of Islamic expansion into Europe was halted. Throughout the Middle Ages, French forces fought in numerous wars against other European powers. Most extensive campaigns were against the English. During a series of conflicts... Well, I mean, it just makes sense that, first of all, that France... I mean, look at the geography. France is basically right there in Europe. You got England, you got Germany, at least from where I'm standing, sitting. And, I mean, it just makes sense that they're going to be... That they're going to be involved in everything. Flicks now known as the Hundred Years' War. The French would suffer significant defeats at several battles, right. including Crecy, Poitiers, and Agincourt, and would later see much of their land devastated by English raids. In spite of these setbacks, the latter portion of the conflict saw the French drive the English from their lands on the continent. As the Middle Ages gave way to the early modern era, the French army, under the reign of Louis XIV, became the largest and most powerful in Europe, almost yes. 400,000 strong. This force pioneered many advancements in military innovation, including logistical and support systems, field hospitals, and the introduction of standardized uniforms to its soldiers. You know, it's interesting, This uh, the for Louis XIV, um, there were a lot of technological advances. One of the, one of them being, of course, field hospitals. Uh, but the, the Americans think that through the Civil War, that the Americans pretty much um, made them, a, 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 you know, a real thing. And it, and it's true. But we did not invent them, Americans. We did not invent them. <laughs> uh, the other thing is that logistics are always a problem, or our modern day World War One, World War Two problem with uh with with france especially world war ii logistics was the key to the battle of france and um the key to the failure the french military record during the early modern era is mixed with both victories and defeats but no more so than any other contemporary nation it was during the late 18th and early 19th centuries when the french reached their zenith of military strength under the leadership of napoleon bonaparte by the way he was average average height for his for his day just saying french armies marched across europe smashing rival powers at the decisive battles such as marengo and austerlitz 
Defeats were caused by weather and logistical issues, such as the campaign against Russia in 1812, or by superior enemy tactics, such as Napoleon's final defeat at Waterloo in 1815. No doubt uh, Napoleon is one of the best, uh, or one of the most notorious, best, brilliant military geniuses in, uh, in, in history when it comes to warfare. Um, as a matter of fact, he is a, what I would think is a good example of somebody who is, you know, who brings a, um, a really great mindset and way of warfare uh, to a war, and uh, then the enemy adapts, overcomes, which is what you're supposed to do, you adapt and overcome, and, you know, ends up leading to a defeat. Now, granted, a lot of people did not learn... <laughs> <laughs> as much but the battle uh, or the uh, idea of, of uh core uh having a core army you know uh made up of different cores um having them fight and coming to the aid of one another was uh very important and um uh, you know things like that they they resonate because then the next war you start you you start based on that kind of uh next idea and and it's almost outdated because the person who started the next war has a new way of fighting. But, uh, and it was a thing during the American Civil War. I know I harken back to that. It was a very interesting war um, in general, but big for Americans. But, uh, you know, a lot of them saw in the South, they saw the Napoleonic ways and the core structure as how they would fight the battles. Uh, towards the end of the war, the um, North or the Union uh, would fight in a very different way, more along the lines of World War One, whereas the Napoleonic concepts, were, which which various generals had varying degrees of, you know, let's stick with the old Napoleonic way, both sides. But the South, uh, Robert E. Lee, uh, he fought with the idea of having that core system, the the flying corps, uh, back and forth. So, I mean, you got to give credit where credit is due. Uh, certain, certainly not cowards during the, uh, uh, during the um, Napoleonic era. During this time, the abilities or courage of the individual French soldier was never in doubt. There you go. A century later, French soldiers found themselves embroiled in one of their most tragic military campaigns. The First World War introduced mass slaughter on an industrial scale, and France found itself in the middle of the conflict, with the majority of the fighting on the Western Front taking place on French soil. Vast areas of the French countryside were transformed into a shell-cratered hellscape, one in which millions of men were trapped for years. During this tumultuous time, French soldiers bore the brunt of the carnage, suffering titanic casualties. In the first two months of the war, over 300,000 French were killed, a number that would swell to half a million by the end of 1914. Hey guys. Oop, there's that guy, he's gonna talk. But I gotta say, that's a hell of a lot of casualties. What is it, 300 some? 300 some thousand, not 300, 300 some thousand in the first few months of the war. That's insane. That's that's a lot. I'm not sure how many, how many did Great Britain suffer? Uh, if you know the first like, uh, first year of war, I think they said it was. Uh, I don't remember what they said, but uh, anyway, uh, you can't you can't deny that, right on French soil, Franco-Prussian War, World War One, World War Two, always get hit. Geography is not their great point. Uh, hence the Maginot Line ideas like that. Um, as bloody, more one which exemplified the tenacity and courage of France's military than the Battle of Verdun. Oh, yeah. In 1916, German General Erich von Falkenhayn launched an offensive aimed at the city of Verdun, allowing such a strategically and symbolically important location to fall. Look at that right there. The French mustache. I'm thinking of, uh, is anyone else thinking of Monty Python when John Cleese is in the statue? Or the statue, wow. The uh the the castle and he's like uh we're looking for the grail and he's like ah we already got one <laughs> in a really outrageous French accent. He looks that that reminds me of John Cleese right there. Uh sorry about my accent. One to enemy hands was unacceptable to French high command, and under the direction of Marshal Philippe Pétain, Verdun was reinforced. Their battle cry at the onset of this fight was on ne passe pas, or they shall, they, shall pass. Pass. they shall not pass. Yeah. 
The battle devolved into a grinding stalemate, with both sides dug in, stubbornly refusing to surrender. Over 40 million artillery shells were fired during the fighting. By the end of the 303rd day, 162,000 French soldiers had lost their lives with another 377,000 wounded, missing, or captured. True to their word, the French held their positions, and the Germans didn't pass those French positions. You know, that's crazy because in World War I, uh, you, you, this is another example of old-fashioned tactics versus then technology comes out, but the tactics don't necessarily change um, anyway, um, I don't know. It's just a thing. We mentioned it with Napoleon, or I did. In the face of these and other monumental losses, the French military did in fact mutiny during the First World War. Strangely enough, however, they didn't lay down their arms. These men stayed in their trenches and continued to resist the Germans, but refused to participate in futile attacks against the heavily entrenched enemy positions. In the words go. of one group of mutineers, you have nothing to fear. We are prepared to man the trenches. We will do our duty and the Germans will not get through. But we will not take part in attacks which will result in nothing but useless casualties. Even when mutineering, French soldiers were still willing to lay down their lives for their nation. That's true. You know, people can only take so much when, uh, uh, when, you, see, when you see, you know, these, these kind of futile attacks. Uh, and tactics didn't change. You know, it takes a lot. It takes till the end of the war for, for things to begin to change. Uh, if, you know, tanks, things like that help out. But uh, uh, we, like I said, we did that in our Civil War. Uh, it wasn't until the end that we started doing, um, you know, sort of World War One style tactics, total war tactics. And, um, yeah, but you can't, you can't blame them for, um, for mutinying. By the end of the war, over one and a half million Frenchmen lay dead with millions more wounded, though estimates vary. Roughly 18% of those who served in the ranks were killed, effectively wiping out a generation of young men. Yet in spite of these catastrophic losses, they still held firm against repeated enemy offensives. It was a and that's, not, and that's no, not taking away anything from Great Britain during the war. But it's about the French, so, you know, I just want to be clear there that I'm not saying like, wow, that's terrible. They're the only ones that took the cash. Absolutely not. I get it. I get it. Generation later that France would earn its reputation as an inept military power. But this is far from the truth. After the outbreak of the Second World War, France and Britain declared war on Germany. After finishing off Poland, the Wehrmacht turned its attention west, breaking through the Low Countries and driving into France to circumvent the Maginot Line, a formidable series of defenses that ended at the Belgian border. Okay, first of all, uh, this guy sounds like Charlie Sheen. Second of all, I think there are a number of different reasons where they get the thing, uh, where they get this idea. First, first one that they, I, I think they're missing. Let me just see if they say it. The oversight by French high command, as well as advances in fast-moving maneuver warfare, caught the Allies off guard, and France was overrun in six weeks, an astonishing feat by any military standard. Yeah, okay, uh, that's what I thought. One of the other things was that the French army um, was not mobile. The, 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 Brit the, the, the British army was very mobile, 500,000 something, give or take, I think it was. You correct me if I'm wrong. But I'm just going, this is live, so you know, I lose 10% of my knowledge when, when I start recording. I mean, you try it. <laughs> um, but they had a standing army that harkened back to World War I. They were based on what won them, or what, what won in World War I. And there wasn't a whole lot of change. I mean, sure, there were updates, better tanks, better planes, but the tactics hadn't changed. And, and you look at what Germany's bringing to the table, and there's just the logistical situation was a nightmare. Now, you can say, yes, the French did attack into Germany um, a, a few, what was it, maybe 10 kilometers, something like that, give or take. But they withdrew when the fighting got a little heavy. That's not good for the reputation. Uh, on the other hand, the, uh, the other part of it being logistically... Uh, horrible. I mean, the the Germans were very technologically savvy. I I do believe that 
that, and this can be argued for another video, but the British were somewhere in between, but fully mechanized, mechanized, mechanized. And um, so what ends up happening is you, you get this breakthrough of the Germans and you're talking about runners, right? For the most part on a motorcycle, you know, World War One style, right? Uh, not relying as much on, on radio communication as the British, as the Germans. And so by the time you get a counterattack together, and I've, I've done a video on this before, it was one of the first ones I did in the year when I started getting the channel moving again. And it was, it, it was like uh, when they were in X place, four days later, there was an attack based on that information. You know, a day or two to get to the generals, generals create something and get everything together for an attack at Y time at X place. And the Germans have already moved forward. It's not how you fight a defensive war. And plus you don't get out of the trenches and move forward to stop an attack in Belgium. I'm just saying, um, but, uh, logistically there was really, they were, they were out. Uh, I mean, their tanks were similar, you know, all that other stuff, but logistics, uh, just, just took it out of them. Um, it was due to this fast. Oh, and, and they had to, they had to surrender, by the way. There was, there was really no other choice. You know, have more people killed or surrender. There was, what, what were they going to do? Uh, and honestly, I think they made the right choice. And, and understanding everything, uh, you know, you, you got to give them uh, kind of credit. I mean, you guys had the, the, the British had the Royal Navy. Russians had like manpower you know, uh, like huge land area. I mean, that that's a little different. Plus it's further in the war. So you have a chance to, you know, get your experience up, but there was no way that the British were going to come to the French's aid, uh, you know, after, after Dunkirk. Cause I mean, you know, unfortunately, you, you know, everything that was mechanized was, was left on the beaches. Capitulation that France gained an undeserved reputation as a nation of cowards with an incompetent military. This, however, is not a fair assessment. Other powers struggled against the German war machine, but had other advantages that France lacked. France didn't have the protection of the high seas enjoyed by Britain or the vast landmass of the Soviet Union and were overrun in short order. There you go. Even when defeated, the French people still fought on, both in exile and as partisans. The French resistance played a vital role in frustrating German plans on the Western Front. Their sabotage, assassination, and intelligence gathering operations were a key component in the success of the D-Day landings in 1944. To this day, the French resistance is seen as the symbolic representation of all resistance movements. Yeah, that's true. Uh, the French resistance uh, after the capitulation, um, and Vichy aside, okay, the Vichy government aside, uh, the Free French uh, really did exemplify the how you um, uh, sort of continue to fight after the fighting is done, um, which is interesting. There's a lot of sabotage, well, a, a whole lot of sabotage. Um, and so, and helpful, you know, when, when the invasion came for D-Day in the south of France, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, and you know what, on a, just on a side note, you guys might find this interesting. There was a BF, BF-109, I'm not sure the submodel, was found intact the last one I believe that they have found in, in Russia, I think from 1943, it was, it had been crash landed and they couldn't figure out why the airframe was pretty much intact. It hadn't been shot up. It hadn't been, you know, it wasn't like a really old model or anything like that. Here it turns out that all, from the forced labor that Germany had, somebody had, and I believe it was uh, a t uh, like a rag, that they were using to, you know, clean the engine and whatnot. Brand new BF-109 shoved a rag in the engine somehow, or pieces of a rag or something like that. And that's what brought it down. And now it's the most complete BF-109, or was it a Focke Wolf 190? Anyway, uh, so anyway, you could, you could see that. And that has to do with the resistance. Uh, that all came out of World War II. 
After the Second World War, France was involved in many conflicts around the world, particularly in former colonies such as Indochina and Algeria. During the global war on terror, the French military provided support in the U.S.-led invasion of Afghanistan. In addition, French air power effectively enforced no-fly zones over Libya, which allowed rebels to overthrow the dictator Muammar Gaddafi. French forces have also been at the forefront of anti-terror operations in other parts of Africa. They are currently the only NATO nation to participate in Operation Barkhane, which combated militants in West Africa. Currently around 3,000 French soldiers are stationed in Chad, the Ivory Coast, Mali, and other nations. Yeah, they had this, uh, and I can't remember what country it was, but they had like just a handful of uh, like elite troops and I think some air power, and they completely stopped a rebel advance. Um, again, I'm just, this is live, so I don't, I'm not going to look it up, but, um, in, in the States, we don't hear much about the French and the war in terror, but we do know that for a large period there, they are the ones in the, or are and were the ones in Africa, um, holding off a lot of terrorist groups, especially since there's no, now there's nobody to stop even sort of the, the Russian influence there. One of the reasons for France's poor reputation can be attributed to their methods in these low-intensity conflicts. While most other nations use a more flashy shock-and-awe approach to combating terrorism and insurgency, France employs a more subtle strategy. In 2007, in order to stop an incursion of rebel forces in the Central African Republic, France sent two waves of paratroopers and a single fighter jet to halt the advance. Is, yeah, no yeah. more than a few dozen were involved, and the French press didn't pick up the story until weeks after. Mali? It's this precision approach that lacks the same fanfare of other nations. I'm sure they said it. I think it was Mali. Which helps contribute to the popular conception of France as lacking military ability. Huh. Throughout the long... All right, that's pretty much the end of the video. So do you do you still think that the French are cowards when it comes to war? Um, and I mean being honest, being completely transparent. You know, I mean, this is a pretty good, albeit it's, you know, it, it's simple history. That's that's who made the video. Oops, sorry about that. That's who made the video. Um, and I don't know, when you kind of lay it all out, uh, I think they do get a bad reputation. And I think a lot of it comes from World War II. But... Here in the States, I have to admit, we don't bust that many chops on the French. Yeah, we joke about it a little bit, but I mean, not like not like British and French go after each other. We, we, we see the two of you guys, you know, going at it and we're like, oh, damn, that's that's hard, you know. <laughs> and uh, but we don't really necessarily feel all that way. We kind of join in, you know, as a side note. But we realize, I think I think at least the more. The people that understand context realize that we have our own issues <laughs> here in the States. But um, let me know what you think uh, down below. Uh, yes? No? Does it change your view a little bit? Um, are you still going to make fun of them? <laughs> also, don't forget about memberships. You can get a uh, – if you get memberships, you can get um, – you can see the videos that I really screw up on or the videos that – and you won't see them here because once they're watched, they're done – uh, you can also see the ones that are mislabeled and I get really ticked off. I do I do upload those <laughs> for members. Um, otherwise, thank you. The channel is doing so well. And again, not a lot of, and I think I said this before, uh, uh, there's not a high percentage of people who are subscribed that are watching. And if you do like this, it would be really helpful to me and to the channel and to the whole group of us if you'd uh, consider subscribing. Um, anyway, thank you all. Stay legends. Be good. Bye-bye.